For thousands of years, people have claimed to use intuition and physiomental abilities to locate objects and features below ground and out of sight. Known as dowsing, this practice still has its advocates, people who are completely convinced that a person properly talented and or trained can detect that which for the rest of us remains hidden deep within the earth. The first known depiction of rhabdomancy, dowsing with a rod or stick of some type, is believed to be found in a cave painting made circa 6000 BCE to Silina Ajer in southeastern Algeria, a Saharan plateau that was once a fertile savanna. Ancient Egyptians and Babylonians were believed to be fond of dowsing for sources of water, certainly a sensible attitude considering the relatively arid environments, and some have even interpreted dowsing as the central theme of a well-known story found in the Old Testament. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. The ancient civilizations of China and India indulged in dowsing as well, quasi-spiritual aspects long since integrated into other practices such as feng shui. In more recent times, dowsing has been known by several names. In Canada, it is often called questing. To technically-minded Soviet researchers of the 20th century, it was known as biophysical location. In the United States, dowsing for water, by far the most common use, is often termed water witching or doodlebugging, the latter being used mostly for the detection of underground deposits of petroleum. Whatever it's called, the basic form dowsing takes is more or less the same throughout the world. A dowser traverses an area, usually outdoors, searching for some desired object or substance, such as gold treasure, crude oil, or, of course, water buried below the surface. The dowser doesn't know the location of what is sought beforehand, which makes the practice a cousin to such alleged psychic abilities as ESP. However, dowsing can claim to be slightly more grounded because it employs the use of physical apparatus and does not typically require practitioners to possess any special mental talent. Supposedly, with the right tools and a little bit of knowledge, anyone can become a successful dowser. Regarding tools, undoubtedly the most common used in dowsing is probably the simplest, a Y-shaped stick of some type of wood, usually referred to as a divining rod, a term taken directly from its ancient Latin name, Virgula Dewina, or Rod Divine. Indeed, most people's idea of a dowser is a man or woman traipsing across a meadow as they hold one of these sticks. At one time, divining rods were commonly made of wood from the willow tree, which often grows by streams and waterways, and thus, in the charming logic of countryside denizens, would gravitate toward water. Modern materials are widely varied, however, and generally consist of whatever is plentiful. The stereotypical forked style is also deemed much less of a necessity, and divining rods can take one of several shapes, or be tossed out altogether, as small, handheld pendulums are sometimes used, as well as pairs of copper or steel rods that are bent at 90 degrees and indicate a find by rotating inward or outward as the target is crossed. A great number of anecdotes and field demonstrations seem to indicate there is something to water dowsing in particular. Indeed, a quick internet search will produce a surprising number of dowsers for hire. Digging a well is an expensive undertaking. If a dowser repeatedly zeroed in on a dry spot, the costs for homeowners and drillers would become prohibitive very quickly. However, golden child of countryside wisdom or not, one cannot ignore the plain fact that when dowsers have been scrutinized under scientific conditions, their abilities begin to evaporate. One possible reason for this seeming paradox is that, on balance, finding water is not particularly all that difficult. It is quite plausible that if one were to dig deep enough in any arable section of land, one would expect to nearly always encounter a deposit. Thus, dowsers are not really doing anything that anyone else can't do. It does not take any special talent to find sand in the Sahara Desert, for example. Of course, short of sinking millions of test wells across the Earth's surface, there is no way of knowing if this is in fact the case. A popular counter to the water everywhere argument is that a dowser's tools are sensitive to flowing water and not static reservoirs. Successful dowsers are therefore zeroing in on a much scarcer target, and by extension are not simply victims of blind luck. In light of known geological facts, this seems doubtful. It has been estimated that only as little as 1% of water located beneath the Earth's surface actually flows anywhere, mostly in karst, areas around the globe that are rich in soluble rocks such as limestone. 
Given enough time, these areas develop a complex system of drainage in the form of caverns and sinkholes, all of which allow water to move, although the rate of movement is considerably slower than one would see in a surface stream or river. Another possibility is that dowsers are indeed doing something, but that something may be much less mysterious than they themselves might realize. Perhaps dowsers are unconsciously reading the land as they pace the countryside, noticing geological strata, subtle dips and swales and topology, gravitating toward greenery and surface indications of subterranean moisture. If we assume dowsers are actually tuning into some unseen radiation, we can confidently make a few assumptions to narrow down the possibilities. There are four major types of radiation found in nature, alpha, beta, neutron, and electromagnetic. Each are comprised of different things and behave in notably different ways. Essentially rogue helium nuclei consisting of two protons and two neutrons, alpha radiation is commonly emitted from radioactive elements found in the Earth's crust, such as uranium, thorium, and radon. Alpha particles are readily detected by conventional means, and the process by which elements decay is well understood. Dowsers do on occasion claim to find some of these radioactive elements, but the usage of this type of radiation to do so seems highly unlikely. Alpha particles are by their nature very heavy and do not penetrate many substances, even something as thin as an ordinary piece of paper and human skin. One wonders how, then, a man armed with nothing more than a forked twig could detect something a dozen meters below ground. Free electrons not attached to an atom, beta radiation is emitted by, among other substances, tritium, strontium-90, and carbon-14, an isotope famous for its use in radiocarbon dating. Being a great deal lighter than alpha, beta radiation will pass through objects more readily, but not an impressive amount. It will penetrate human skin, for example, but will struggle to make it through a winter jacket. Again, it's hard to imagine how a dowser would locate anything using this. Even if something as innocuous as liquid water gave off copious amounts of beta radiation, which it does not normally do, being buried in any more than a meter into the ground would prevent anyone from ever knowing about it. Neutron radiation is, unsurprisingly, comprised of neutrons. These neutrons are extremely energetic and are therefore very dangerous, as they are not hindered by any everyday substance in everyday quantity. Neutron radiation can and will easily damage all tissues within the human body and lead to all sorts of medical problems. As a whole, dowsers don't suffer a particularly high proportion of cancer, which one would expect for a group bathing in what is essentially the aftermath of a nuclear bomb blast. This, and the fact that none of the items typically searched for by dowsers emit neutrons, would seem to make this unlikely as well. Probably the most familiar to the majority of viewers, Electromagnetic, or EM radiation, is an emitted wave that has both an electric and a magnetic field. From radio waves to gamma rays, the penetrative properties and intrinsic danger of EM radiation vary greatly upon the associated energy level. Visible light in all its rainbow of colors is part of the EM spectrum, clocking in at about 430 terahertz for a deep red light up to about 750 terahertz for the brightest blue. Speculatively speaking, EM radiation is a potential candidate for dowser's abilities. Magnetic fields like those that accompany EM waves pervade our environment. As they are often subtle, yet demonstrably real, the generation or warping of such fields could be detected by the kind of primitive manner dowsers employ. Just how this would work is difficult to explain, but it could conceivably be shown to work given a properly constructed experiment. Sir William F. Barrett, a professor of physics at the Royal College of Science in Dublin, conducted a series of somewhat informal experiments in the early 20th century, hoping to generate data on the efficacy of dowsing and possibly gain insight into the mechanics involved. It was Professor Barrett's opinion that dowsing was the result of some poorly understood psychic ability, as opposed to something more physical like sensitivity to subtle environmental cues. In a typical example of Barrett's many tests, quote, a coin was to be hidden in some part of the room in the absence of the dowsers, and while all those present in the room looked out the window. The person hiding the coin was then to leave the room, and one of the dowsers called in to try and find the coin." Unquote. Specifically, the coin spoken of was hidden beneath the seat of one of 46 identical chairs, the first time by Barrett himself. This test was repeated five times, with the coin hidden each time. When a dowser by the name of Young was escorted into the room and asked to locate the coin, he did so almost immediately, without any difficulty, on two successive trials. This is quite an impressive feat when one considers the odds of such an occurrence are over 2,000 to 1. 
However, one does wonder exactly how random the placement of the coin was, and if, when placing the coin, the associated chairs had been inadvertently moved, and thus became a blazingly obvious clue to anyone with above-average powers of observation. Dr. Salko Tromp, a Dutch-born geologist and proponent of the physical explanation for dowsing, theorized dowsers were sensitive to variations in local electromagnetic fields. To test this hypothesis, a tangent galvanometer, comprised of a one-meter diameter wooden hoop wrapped in a single coil of wire, was mounted on a swivel in the middle of a room. An electric current to the wire was then randomly applied, intensified, or removed altogether by a technician sitting across the room. Neither the dowser nor the person recording the results were informed of the state of the current or the orientation of the hoop. Using a horseshoe-shaped rod as a divining tool, one of a number of blindfolded and earplugged dowsers would slowly walk through the room and attempt to detect the variations in the artificially generated field. After 20 trials, dowsers responded with about an 80% accuracy. Oddly, when the experiment was repeated using a pendulum instead of the horseshoe-shaped rod, dowsers who were not successful the first time were now able to detect the field. Moreover, those successful seemed to be able to discern a field strength of around 0.1 gauss. For reference, a typical refrigerator magnet has a strength of about 100 gauss, and the average strength of the Earth's magnetic field is around 0.5 gauss. While certainly impressive, it should be noted that some subjects took as many as 11 seconds to respond to any change, a fact which may indicate less than rigorous scientific standards. Perhaps an answer of, I'm not sure, was recorded as a confirmation. Tromp also tested a number of dowsers out of doors by having them traverse a predetermined path through a pasture. After each dowser's reactions were carefully recorded, a resistivity survey was performed along the path, a test where the relative electrical resistance of soil is measured. It was discovered that dowsers reacted to areas of low resistivity somewhat more than one would expect by chance. Psychic explanations of dowsing, such as those promoted by Barrett, do indeed sound far-fetched. What exactly is psychic energy? How is it detected? What makes dowsers special? Why can't literally anyone with a brain be a dowser? Physical explanations, on the other hand, already have analogs in the natural world. Many animals are magnetoreceptive, a well-documented phenomenon that has been observed in sharks, bees, lobsters, termites, migratory birds, and even some species of bacteria. For humans to have a similar, perhaps vestigial, magnetic sense is certainly not outside the realm of possibility. The aforementioned bacteria have been shown to utilize magnetite crystals within their membranes to align themselves with Earth's magnetic field. The beaks of many birds and snouts of many fish also contain proportionately high levels of magnetite. The human brain also contains magnetite, concentrated into the lower, more reptilian areas, a fact discovered in part by geophysicist Stuart Gilder of Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. None of this legitimizes dowsing, of course, but scientifically credible connections do seem to give the ancient practice an air of respectability. Between March 22nd and March 31st, 1979, in the Italian town of Formello, a small community about 30 kilometers north of the city of Rome, an experiment was constructed to test the efficacy of water dowsers, a test conceived and implemented by internationally renowned illusionist James Randi, journalist and author Piero Angela, and Italian broadcasting conglomerate Radio Televisione Italiana. On a plot of land measuring 10 meters by 9 meters, three pipes, each 8 centimeters in diameter, were buried approximately a half meter deep, the pathway of each pipe a carefully guarded secret. At one end of the plot, water from a 5,000 liter truck was supplied to each of the three pipes, each inlet equipped with a valve labeled A, B, and C, allowing a 5 liter per second gravity-fed flow of water to be controlled in each pipe independently. A drainage reservoir was positioned against the opposite side of the plot, again with the outlets labeled. Four individuals ultimately were to be tested, all of them agreeing to a specific set of conditions. Giorgio Fontana, Lino Borgia, a young man with the last name of Stanizola, who was also a pupil of Lino Borgia, and Vittorio Senatore, all men with a high opinion of their own abilities and a reputation for success in the dowsing field. Each participant would calibrate his equipment of choice on an exposed pipe with water flowing through it in a manner similar to the test area. This would ensure, under the men's own admission, that they were able to detect the flow of water at the site. Each participant would douse the entire area before any valves were opened, so that any natural sources of flowing water could be determined and thus eliminated from the results. Once the test commenced, each participant would be given three attempts to detect the path of flowing water. 
Only one pipe would be flowing at any given time. To avoid confusion and make the test as fair as possible, no pipes cross themselves, though an active pipe may cross an inactive pipe at one of several places. The active valve would be chosen at random for each attempt. This would, of course, mean that a pipe may be used more than once. Dowsers would not be made aware of which valves were open at any particular time. Each dowser was to place marker flags, at least 10 but no more than 100, along the path where he detected flowing water. Provided the marker was placed within 10 centimeters of the center of the active pipe, the flag would count as a hit. For the test to be considered a success, at least two-thirds of the total number of markers placed would have to be hits. This ensured that whatever was found by the participating dowser was genuinely detected and not simply the result of good fortune. If two out of the three attempts made were deemed successful, then the test would be considered passed, earning the participant a check for $10,000 supplied by Mr. Randy himself. The first three attempts were made by Giorgio Fontana, a dowser heralding from the city of Pisa, who claimed, among other things, to be able to divine the location of petroleum deposits, a claim which extended to the supposed discovery of a giant subterranean river of oil running between Greenland and the Mediterranean. Using a willow rod, and later switching to a pendulum, Fontana scanned the test site for natural water sources. At once, he determined that a pair of underground streams intersected somewhere below the site, as the local subsurface geography was not known with 100% accuracy, this may or may not have been the case. Nevertheless, Mr. Fontana concluded the streams would not hinder his test. Valve C was the first to be opened. Fontana quickly worked his way across the plot, directing the on-site technician to where the markers should be set. In all, 30 markers were placed, and only one falling within the acceptable zone. Again, valve C was opened for attempt number two, and again, Fontana carried his pendulum over the freshly turned earth, this time veering noticeably further into the plot than before. Despite an intriguing mimicry of the pipe layout during the first portion of this attempt, only a total of two out of the 32 markers were within acceptable limits. Valve B was selected for Fontana's third attempt, but the dowser declined to continue, and it was agreed by all parties that his first attempt could be duplicated and used for his third. A hydrologist from Trento, known for his work regarding underground water levels in the city of Florence, Lino Borgia used an unusual form of divining rod, a pair of short, rigid dowels hinged near one end by a pin. Borgia found no natural sources of water, and had no difficulty detecting the flowing water in the exposed pipe and creating a baseline for testing. Valve B was opened as he commenced his first attempt at dowsing, which turned out to be wildly inaccurate. Valve A was then opened for both his second and third attempts. On attempt number two, Borges simply retraced his first run, apparently under the impression that the same valve had been opened as before. However, the third time out, the supply truck feeding water into the testing area inadvertently ran dry. Already partway through his final attempt, Borgia was not made aware of this, and he continued to detect a now non-existent flow of water. The third subject was a man named Stanizola, who was a pupil of Professor Borgia and used a flexible wand made of willow. Although he claimed to detect a stream of natural water, he was unable to detect any of the water flowing from the exposed test pipe. This created an insurmountable problem, as without a baseline for detection, there was no way for the dowser to know whether he was correct or not. An impromptu alternative test was devised, in which Stanizola was blindfolded and escorted around the plot to eight random locations, then asked if he was standing over the predetermined course of the underground stream which he had already detected. Of the four times he was standing above the supposed flowing water he had mapped out, he only confirmed the fact twice, and two of the four times he was positioned at a location away from the water, he incorrectly stated he was above it. Using a simple stick, possibly a piece of reed or cane, roughly broken and looped in the middle, the fourth and final testee, Vittorio Senatore, scanned the experiment zone for natural sources of water and found nothing of note. Due to time constraints, both experimenters and Mr. Senatore agreed to reduce the number of test attempts from three to one. Mr. Senatore undertook his single dowsing, in which valve B was active, performing his task with great concentration. Throughout the entire time, his dowsing implement moved quite dramatically, even launching itself from the man's grip, striking a wayward cameraman by accident. Because of these violent motions, the device broke and was thus replaced no less than five times. Of the four subjects tested, only two, Fontana and Stanizola, managed to detect any natural sources of flowing water, and neither of them agreed with the other about where said water was. 
it was never independently determined if any underground sources of water were in fact below the site, and it is therefore possible that the dowsers were in fact sensing something real, despite Stanizola's abysmal showing that proved no better than chance. But if viewed in the larger context of the experiment's results, this possibility seems remote. Only Giorgio Fontana achieved any real measure of success, and then only by a moment of good fortune on his part. To be fair, all parties involved in the construction and operation of the experiment noted the subjects were honest and upfront with their beliefs and perceived abilities. All four men had expressed extreme confidence in themselves beforehand, yet they readily accepted the abysmal results, although in Borgia's case this acceptance was qualified with copious amounts of rationalization relating to everything from sunspot activity to geomagnetism. Despite the decidedly negative conclusion, it must be pointed out that as a whole, the experiment was of little value scientifically. There was no contingent for statistical data, as the whole affair was designed around a strict binary conclusion. Either the dowsers would find the running water, or they would not. But this simply isn't sensible. It would have certainly raised eyebrows, for example, if one of the four men had traced a path very similar to the actual water flow, but a few too many centimeters to one side. The markers placed into the ground would not have counted, but no one could have denied that something was going on. Indeed, some of the attempts made by the dowsers seem to very slightly suggest such a possibility. Throughout the 1980s, a series of experiments were carried out by Richard Bailey from the University of Newcastle and Eric Cambridge of Dunham University, both experts on the architecture of medieval churches. Their chief subject was a retired engineer and amateur dowser, Dennis Briggs, who had contacted the men with an aim to help locate unseen traces of ancient structures. In 8 out of 13 archaeological sites, Briggs had detected buried walls and other architectural features to a seemingly high degree of accuracy. At St. Mary's Church in Woodhorn, in Woodhorn, England, Briggs, as well as a handful of other dowsers and assistants, claimed to have detected a number of wall foundations. At another pre-Norman era church in Pontland, confusingly also known as St. Mary's, Briggs detected the hidden remnants of a rectangular structure at the eastern end of the building, presumably an apes. Two trenches were then carefully excavated at the Woodhorn site, one unearthing nothing of note and the other appearing to perfectly match Briggs' prediction. At Pontland, where the apes was purported to be, no trace of any such structure was found, Strangely, however, when consulting an old architectural plan, it was learned that a wooden step and plinth for an altar had been positioned in this location between 1885 and 1972. No physical trace was left of the items, yet Briggs seemed to have knowledge of their existence. A lucky guess, perhaps? In homage to the glory of Christ as seen in the rising sun, and perhaps also to the direction of Jerusalem, an apes in early churches was usually located at the eastern end of the floor plan and typically contained an altar. It would not be a stretch to say that Briggs was probably aware of this and acted accordingly. Of course, the successful dowsing for ancient walls is not so easily brushed aside. Even a 50% success rate seems to be far greater than simple chance would allow. The churches studied by Bailey and Cambridge had been standing in one form or another for at least a thousand years. Renovations, reconstructions, and additions over the centuries would leave countless buried artifacts. To correctly guess the location of an ancient bit of foundation may not be any more remarkable than standing under a great oak and detecting a large root a meter or so below the surface. As archaeologist Carl Feigens explains on his blog, Archaeology Review, quote, Old churches and the sites they're constructed on are palimpsests of archaeological data. Instead of looking for a needle in a haystack, Bailey et al. were showing the world how they were successfully able to find needles in piles of needles." Unquote. Despite of or because of increasing scientific scrutiny, dowsing has in part evolved into a more or less partially spiritual practice. Many dowsers no longer traipse through meadows in search of well water or precious minerals, but wave pendulums over people's bodies to discern illness. Proponents often answer all claims of charlatanism with, but dowsing works. Considering centuries and mountains of positive anecdotes, it's hard to argue with this apparent fact. But anecdotes, no matter how numerous, do not equate to evidence. But if a dowser's abilities are genuine, how does the dowser's tool of choice know when and how to react? And if the whole subject amounts to nothing more than fantasy, why does the tool exhibit responsive movements at all? 
Many researchers and skeptics have theorized dowsers and their tools are experiencing an idiomotor response, where small, imperceptible movements are made by a person in response to an emotional stimuli. Essentially, it is a much more subtle version of a passenger in an automobile mashing their foot against a non-existent brake pedal when the driver has a close call at an intersection. If one believes there is water in a particular spot, their arms and hands will move in just such a way as to cause the tool in their hands to snap up, bend down, or fly away altogether, like that of Mr. Vittorio Senatore. Perhaps, ultimately, there is something to water witching, questing, and dowsing. If the electromagnetic experiments of Dr. Trump and others are to be believed, the idea is not totally disconnected from reality. And, as long as one doesn't rely completely on the movements of a dowser's divining rod, belief in such a mysterious power is little more than a harmless quirk. Skeptics are right to warn against the dangers of self-delusion and the substitution of hoped fantasy for the reality we actually inhabit, but said skeptics must care to not go too far in their rebuke, lest they become dogmatic gatekeepers, ignoring legitimate mysteries that do not conform to their own preconceived notions without giving them the benefit of experimental scrutiny. Indeed, the willingness of Bailey and Cambridge, Barrett and others to investigate what many in their respective fields consider fringe is quite admirable. It is better to risk professional embarrassment for the sake of possibly gaining insight than to close oneself off to new ideas and never find new intellectual paths to explore. And exploration is, after all, what science is about. Not just a method to throw light upon the shadows of the unknown, but a means to venture ever deeper into the proverbial cave and discover the endless wonders within.